What we all know is that life has a beginning and life has an end. There was a moment when we all took our first breath and a moment when we will each breathe our last. Yet central to the Christian faith is the conviction that being born isn't the same as being alive. There is a second birth which follows the first. When our eyes are opened, a seed of faith is planted. When our hearts first cry out, Lord Jesus, I surrender. I give my life to you. From this day forward, you alone will be my glory and my all. I desire nothing but you. But seeds are always planted with the hope that they will grow. It's one thing to be alive. Growing into full maturity involves so much more. And like each seed planted in the soil, real Christianity, seen in the life of one who is living in the assurance of the hope found in Jesus, whose faith is bearing fruit, whose love for all neighbors is present in every thought, every word, each action. This also involves so much more. And so we must ask, are we content with simply being alive? Or in all the moments that fall between our first breath and our last, are we willing to follow Jesus into the overwhelming beauty and joy of a life fully surrendered to Him? Well, good evening, everybody. Oh, let's try that one more time. Y'all know how we do this. Let's do it one more time. Good evening, everybody. There we go. That's better. Uh, if we haven't met, if this is our first time meeting, my name is Julian Hobby. I'm the lead pastor for this service. Uh, it's always a delight to be here with you in worship. Uh, if you have your Bibles, let me invite you to get them now and open them with me. We're going to go back to exactly where we were last week in Matthew chapter 5. So again, you're going to go to the end of the Old Testament to go to the right. Matthew chapter 5, we're going to spend a little bit of time there. Now, if you don't have a Bible and you'd like one, or if you have one and you'd like a better one, or you'd like a different one, we would love to be responsible. I would love to be responsible for getting a Bible into your hands. So you can send me an email to Pastor Julian at fmcm.org, uh, and I would love to get a Bible into your hands. Uh, we're going to spend a little bit of time continuing in this new season that we're focused on. I'm going to say a little bit more about that here in a second. But as is my custom, week in and week out, I will invite you to respond with me. If you are there, if you're in Matthew chapter 5 now, say amen. amen. And if you're not, say hold up. All right. I actually had that happen in the 11 o'clock service the other week. And someone came to me afterwards and was like, Pastor Julian, I promise I know where Matthew chapter 5 is. So I'm like, all right, you don't got you don't got to feel shamed. All right, uh, so good, we're all there now. In the text, uh, I'm going to come to a reading of the text here in a second. Uh, but we are in a season, as you saw in the graphics that were on the screen earlier, we are in a, a season focused on this idea of real Christianity. Now, if you haven't been here uh, or if this is your first time watching online, let me say a little bit about uh, this real Christianity season. We've been on a nearly year-long journey in conversation and pursuit of this idea of real Christianity. We've done so because of a shared conviction of our need for renewal and for revival. Now we come to what is now our third season. And in this third season, we are focusing on maturing as a Christian. The first season was on becoming a Christian. The second was on being a Christian. And now we are focused on maturing as a Christian. And over the next two weeks, I want to focus as we begin this new season, on two common pitfalls that are perhaps some of the greatest challenges to our spiritual maturity. Now, as I said, we're going to revisit our text from last week, Matthew chapter 5, verse 48, and the text reads like this. Be perfect. Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. Now, as we discussed last week, we are, we are called to maturity, and that's to be complete and whole, to be perfect in love as Christ is perfect in love. For a few minutes tonight, as we continue in this season focused on maturing as a Christian, I want to talk through one of the pitfalls, the first of these two weeks of pitfalls uh, to growth in Christ. So I want to talk to you a little bit 
about, don't, don't get locked up in the title, it's just helping me to focus it, but on the idea of legalism, the danger of doing good. Legalism, the danger of doing good. Now, my uh, youngest daughter, she's sitting right over there. Oh, look, my family's over there, cool. Uh, she's sitting right over there hanging out. And usually she's the one that will, if no one else will say anything to me in this service, that, that child will speak to me. It sometimes gets a little weird, but it's fine. Um, she's in piano lessons right now. Now, I'm a piano player, and so I love watching this. Uh, originally, one of her grandmothers wanted her to be in piano lessons, and she thought it would be a good idea if I taught her. I quickly told her that will not be a good idea. I can't be my child's teacher, not at all. Uh, and so she decided she was going to... She. She put up the money, and she got Jordan an instructor. And so Jordan has been in piano lessons for over a year now, and it's really fun watching her learn uh, how to do this. And this is just another thing that she and I have in common. So there are times she's had recitals, uh, and I've had to be her accompanist for the recitals, which is great. Like, we recorded videos and everything, and me and Jordan playing, and I was like, cool. I got, I got one of my kids did it. My, my oldest, she sings. My youngest, she sings louder than everybody in this room. Uh, and my youngest, she plays piano like her dad. And so we're at this really fun point where we're, we're able to do this. And there was a point where uh, I was sitting at the piano, and I was just playing through some scales. Uh, and she came, and she looked at me, and she was like, how do you do that? And she kind of marveled at the fact that I could play these scales faster than her. Never mind, I am much older than her. I've been doing this much longer. She just looked at me like, how come you can do this and I can't? And so I brought her to the piano and I showed her, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to, well, we'll do this. I showed her, had her play a C major scale. I won't go into a whole bunch of music theory, but a basic C major scale. She played it just like this. There we go. It's like, that's right. All white keys, no black keys, perfect. All right. Now, you can't really see me that well. There's no camera up here, so you can't see my hand. But can anyone tell me? We'll see if this happens. What, what was wrong with that? Oh, nobody wants to call the baby wrong. Okay, fine. That's all right. No problem. I'll show you again. She played it like this. Nobody? Look at that. Oh, my wife has been at the, some of the lessons, so she just yelled out finger placement. That's right. She played that entire scale. with now The notes were right. She played a C major scale, and it sounded right. All of the notes were the right notes, but she played it like that. And she looked at me wondering why can I play it faster because I was. And she was like, how did you do that? And what, I, what she didn't realize is how you begin to practice will affect your dexterity in the future. Because she didn't know the proper placement of the fingers the, the fastest she could ever do that could only be as fast as one finger can go. And I know that in order to be doing this, learning finger placement will help you later on in the future to be able to do other things. Appreciate that, appreciate that. Yeah, yeah. I told y'all, don't gas me up. We'll be here a while. I had to show her that how we begin, how matters more than the what. She could do all the things, make the right sounds, play the right notes, and it will never be as proficient to give her the kind of dexterity she needs for how she will perform more extensive, more elaborate songs later on in her musical journey. What she didn't know is that how you practice will always impact your performance. And how you practice especially fundamentals establishes habits that carry across into everything you play. I know that the how matters more than the what. But this principle isn't only applicable to music. It's a principle of maturity that also applies to our spiritual life as well. How we practice the fundamentals of our faith impacts our ability to make music out of a life so filled with disharmony. One of the potential pitfalls to growth is our constant drift. Our constant drift toward this practicing of bad fundamentals. A constant drift toward legalism. 
Now, legalism is a way of trying to make music out of your life by playing the notes with one finger. So let me see if I can help us to be able to gain a little greater dexterity. Now, legalism is a tricky term. What do I mean by legalism? This is a a tricky word that gets thrown around a bit. Sometimes we use it just to refer to a person who we think of as narrow-minded. But that doesn't quite capture it. In reality, it expresses itself in far more subtle ways than simply being narrow-minded. In his ebook, How Can I Develop a Christian Conscience, author and theologian R.C. Sproul suggests that legalism is abstracting the law of God from its original context. Another way of thinking about this is trying to affect our own salvation with our efforts. Let me keep going. Now, the question is, why does this even matter? None of us will, very rarely will you go to any church and hear a a, a sermon on legalism. Why does this matter? Well, like the conversation I had with my daughter at the piano, how matters more than the what? How we go about living out our Christian life, how we practice our faith matters. And it's such a substantial threat because it's so easy to do. Let me ask you something. Have you Ever been, some of y'all are going to want to raise your hands for this, but that's fine. Have you ever been driving in your car and you either got and read a text or tried to send a text while you were driving? See, see, there's one. There we go. Somebody looked at me. Everybody just kind of, I don't want to be that guy. Perhaps you've been in a scenario where you were driving and thought, ah, you just need to write this one thought down. You don't normally do this. You're just going to do this this one time. Uh, and you had the thought, so you, you didn't pull over because that was going to get too far out the way. So you just, while you were driving, you just jotted your note down or whatever or returned an email harmless. Now, I know no one in here would be that person, so perhaps you've been in the car with other people who have done this, or you've heard about other people doing it, right? Yeah, more nods. Okay, yeah, more. All right, cool. You probably didn't know this, but the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration has an entire campaign around preventing texting and driving. It's simply, you drive, you text, you pay. I read that and I didn't really like that, especially the pay part, but whatever. What they know is that a distracted driver is potentially a deadly driver. They understand, as we do too, that wherever you focus, you tend to drift. Now that's true not just in the car, but in our life with God as well. The challenge of legalism is that it pulls our focus off the thing upon which our eyes and our hearts should be focused. And like most drivers who fall prey to this kind of drifting behavior, we think the problem is outside ourselves. It's other drivers. They're the problem. It's not us. Other people drive bad, not me. We tend to be deficient at detecting our own bites. I have a really close friend who, this is, this is one of the difficulties of both being a pastor and having gone to seminary. It's like anytime you're in any kind of remotely religious situation with people, they always like drift to you. So at Thanksgiving, I'm all, everybody's looking at me to pray every time, like, like, like they don't love Jesus too. Like it's not just me. I went to church with all of y'all growing up. I know y'all can pray too, but they looked at me to pray. That part is not always the most fun because sometimes I just want to eat. So all I get at Thanksgiving is Jesus wept. Amen. Let's go. <laughs> but what I do love is I have friends that will call me as they are starting to, they're, as, they're, as we're getting older, they're starting to explore the Bible more and they have questions about the Bible. And I'm like, I love it. I spend a lot of years in the classroom just to be able to do this. <laughs> so cool. So I have a friend that calls me uh, because he's, he's gone through some things recently and he's just starting to get into the Bible more. So we talk. Like he'll call me when he has problems with the text. He's trying to understand something. Uh, and, and, and we have this really unique relationship right now. And he calls him periodically to talk through uh, some of the things that he's reading or podcasts that he's listening to. And recently he called me and we were talking through a difficult text. He was reading something in Genesis. I was like, yeah, man, Genesis be crazy. And we were talking through that some. Uh, and he wasn't frustrated, but he was thrown by how confused he was. And I was like, clearly, you've never read Genesis. <laughs> so much of it is confusing. And he just wanted to know the right answer to a problem he couldn't make sense of out of the text. 
Julian, what's the answer? Now, I did not make it better as most people who have gone to seminary do. And I told him, it depends. <laughs> it just depends. Uh, and, and I told him there are some things that do not require our certainty. They simply require our faith. I, I can't begin to explain God's mind, but I can tell you something about God's heart. So I don't have an answer except to say I'm working it out too. And what he wanted, though, was the right answer. You remember the back of the algebra book and how it had the answers in the back of the book? He wanted that. And I was like, you can turn to the back. You're just going to find maps and a concordance. There are no answers in the back of the book. And then I asked, why does this bother you so much? There's so much in your life that you can't possibly be certain about. Why are you so bothered by this? And he told me, I just don't want to get this wrong. I don't want to share this with anyone and have the wrong answer. I've made so many mistakes in the past, and I just want God to be pleased. I don't want to upset God. See, my friend got so caught up in trying to do what he thought would be the right thing and avoid any hint of a mistake because he felt that if he did this right, God would make his life go easier. That was at the bottom of his thinking. He did what I assume much of us do. We have a reading, a way of reading the Bible that's almost formulaic. If I do good things, then good things will happen to me. Conversely, we believe that if I do bad things, then bad things will happen to me. So far, for many of us, that just makes good sense. After all, the Bible says you reap what you sow, and that's simple calculus. If you do good, you are owed good. And if you do bad, you are owed bad. Now, I don't know if you've been there, but I have. I've sat on my floor like my friend wailing in an ash heap asking, God, why is this happening to me? Why won't you fix this? Because I felt like I had done the right stuff. You should make this easier. Perhaps you are there right now. You think like my friend. You think that God is the cosmic police who roams around the streets seeking who needs to be convicted. Perhaps you think like others that God is like a genie in a bottle. Basically that you wouldn't say that or think that. But if you just rub the Bible or the bottle the right way or say the right words, you, you, you're the person that goes, watch what you pray for. Because God somehow is like this kind of mischievous <laughs> entity that if you don't pray the right words or do the right things, then the wrong things are going to happen. And it'll be your fault. Perhaps right now you are thinking as you are walking through the throes of some of the greatest difficulty in which you have found yourself before, I'm, not, I'm doing all the right stuff and I quit the bad stuff I used to do. Why won't you fix my life? Let me suggest to you That if you're thinking that, if you're there, like so many of us are or have been, that your focus has begun to drift. Your focus has gotten distracted. You are looking at the wrong thing and you have begun to drift. I'll say more. You have missed, we have missed, that the Christian life is not about the what. It's always about the who. It isn't about what you do. It's about who has already done what you could not do. That was an amen. I felt that. A vibrant spiritual life in Christ is a life lived in love with Christ, a life where where we make Christ our joy and the main attraction. And just like any relationship, a healthy relationship does bring about change, but change is not the reason for the relationship. Change is the outcome of any relationship. Think of your own life. If you're married or dating someone and the heart of your relationship is just watching the things that they do or don't do, you are not going to be in for a good relationship. I can tell you right now, 16 years of marriage, if you you standing at the, at the bedroom door watching to see if your spouse is going to wash the dishes or not, is going to pick up their socks or not. And every day you, you running this calculus in your mind, you are in for a difficult time. Let me stop. Some of y'all looking at me like that's where y'all at right now. I'll, I'll quit. Let me move. I don't want nobody to come send me emails or find me later.
Life and relationship brings about change, but change is not the purpose of the relationship. After all, throughout the Bible, deeply flawed people found redemption in God and even in their redemption still lived very flawed lives. David was one of my favorite characters growing up, but David was a terrible dude, right? Like, he was not cool. I mean, he was, but like, he wasn't. Like, he really wasn't. Like, this was a guy that like, I had to monitor the room. Okay, so this is a dude that like, like slept with a woman and then like it was one of his soldiers' wives and then he got the sol- like called the soldier from the battlefield, come home, tried to like entice him to, to sleep with his wife so that he could cover up in the event that a baby came. The dude was honorable and was like, nah, I can't, my guys are out the field. I can't be out here like this when they out there. David sends him back with a letter to the general to put him on the front line and has him killed. I mean, like, that's like mafioso type stuff. Like, he slept with the guy and then had the man killed whose wife he slept with. That was like crazy. He's a bad dude. And yet, even with his flaws, he was known as a man after God's own heart. It wasn't the perfection that qualified him. It wasn't the mistakes that disqualified him. He simply had a heart that was angled toward God. And he reminds us it's about the posture of the heart more than it is about the possession of right things. It's not in having the right ideas. It's just in loving the right God. Here's the quintessential question you need to ask yourself. We all need to ask ourselves. Who will I trust? Who's sitting on the throne of your heart? Do I trust God? Am I willing to entrust my life to Christ or is it all on me? At the heart of legalism is an issue of trust and control. We fall into this pitfall on the road to maturity most easily because we want to please God. After all, the Christian life does call us to do good. And the Christian life does affect our behavior. Trust and control, however, don't mix. My daughter and I, my youngest daughter, the one who plays the piano, we were were playing earlier and uh, I got them some crumble cookies. And, and, and I had Jordan cleaning up, like put all of the dishes in, on the table and the counters in the sink and put everything in the dishwasher up. And uh, my daughter, she's like me, she and my wife, we, we get easily, dist- probably more like me, we get really easily distracted. Y'all see how I tried to put my wife in that? Yeah. It's just me. Get easily distracted. We, she's the one like me that like I'm washing dishes and I got my iPad up watching YouTube while I'm washing dishes. I might be telling way too much on myself tonight. Anyway, uh, and so Jordan gets distracted. So I told her, you know, I, I had her little piece of crumble cooking. I'm like, here's the deal. You got a couple minutes. If, uh, if you don't put these dishes up, I'm going to eat that cookie. And she was just like, Daddy, no. And I was like, okay, I'm not going to do it. And then she kept washing the dishes and turning and looking at me. And I'm like, what are you doing? I said, I'm not going to eat it. She was like, I know, I trust you, but I'm nervous. And I was like, what? That don't work. You can't both trust me and not trust that I'm not going to do what I said I won't do. I know, I know, I know, I do, I trust you, but I'm nervous. I'm like, I don't think you understand that trust and control don't mix. You cannot trust me and then try to control what I'll do. You can't watch everything I'm doing and trust me at the same time. And we have this in our mind. Trust and control don't mix. We cannot produce our own maturity spiritually any more than we could physically. And the fact, father of, of, of even our movement, the father of the Methodist movement had the same issue. He, he had been going about doing ministry, going through all the stuff, doing all the things, and then had this tremendous failure and had to come back back to England, go back home, take the boat all the way back home. And he was with this group of people who he saw that had incredible faith and a type of peace and joy that he could not fathom. And he gets back home after failing. Brother is sick, almost dead. And brother eventually comes to this moment where his brother has this incredible moment of, 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 of 
finding the spirit and the spirit kind of falls on him. And then John Wesley makes his way to a service at Aldersgate and he gets there. And when a person is reading the epistle or a preface to the epistle of the Romans, Wesley says this, in the evening I went very unwillingly to a society in Aldersgate where one was reading Luther's preface to the epistle to the Romans. About a quarter before nine, while he was describing the change which God works in the heart through faith in Christ, I felt my heart strangely warmed. I felt I did trust in Christ, Christ alone for salvation. And an assurance was given me that he had taken away my sins, even mine, and saved me from the law of sin and death. The father of the movement that that this church bears its name, this was a person, mind you, who who had had tremendous failure in Georgia. He had already been in ministry. He had returned to England and returned from Georgia because of this tremendous failure. And in this travel, he learned he was doing the right stuff the wrong way. He had not trusted. But on this evening, just hearing a preface to Scripture, he came to trust in Christ, to trust Christ with his life and his destiny. He learned, as we should, that our eyes have got to be fixed on Christ in this journey of maturity and not fixed on ourselves. The truth is the kind of legal, this kind of legalism is so easy to drift towards. When you are in disaster, it is easy to drift into these statements to try to find understanding. It's easy to think, I do the right stuff, and I have been. I am basically kind to people. I go to church. I serve others and give to the poor. I pray. I read my Bible. I study scripture. I go to Sunday school. I go to Bible study. I'm in a small group. I stop drinking. I stop smoking. It's easy to tell that story and wonder why God won't make life easier. But you must remember that these actions are expressions of a changed heart, not means of obtaining favor. You've been married long enough or dated anyone long enough? No, if you're doing things to be able to get them to do things, that's not love, that's manipulation. Mm. These things are done because of what we know God already did, not because of what we are trying to get God to do. And rather than looking at all your eyes, all the stuff I do, you need to fix your eyes on the one who has already seen you through many dangers, toils, and snares. You need to change your perspective because where you focus, you will drift. So rather than looking to yourself to save yourself, you need to remember Scripture's counsel that I will lift up mine eyes to the hills from whence cometh my help. Why? Because my help comes from the Lord. Or perhaps you need to remember the gospel hymn's affirmation. Why should I feel discouraged? Why should the shadows come? Why should my heart be lonely and long for heaven and home when Jesus is my portion? My constant friend is he. His eye is on the sparrow and I know he watches me. That's why I sing because I'm happy. I sing because I'm free. His eye is on the sparrow. And if God can watch the little itty bitty sparrow, then I know that he watches me. The danger of legalism is that it shifts your focus from Christ back to yourself. And where we focus, we drift. Our life, you must remember, recall, renew, and reestablish for yourself over and over again. Our life is beyond self-repair. You aren't strong enough. As beautiful as you are, you aren't beautiful enough. As smart as you are, you aren't smart enough. As gifted as you are, you aren't gifted enough. You, our life is beyond self-repair. We need someone far beyond us to bring us to the life we were always meant to live, to make our lives make music. The goal of the Christian life is deep change through deep fellowship with God, but relationships require trust. Trust and control do not mix. Trying to trust God while also maintaining control is like trying to operate a car without fuel. All the pieces may work for a time, but the engine wasn't meant to run this way. It can perform for a while, but over time it's going to burn everything out. The Christian life does affect behavior, but changed behavior is not the end goal of the Christian life. You can't do enough to save yourself. 
And if you approach it this way, you will constantly be frustrated. The key, however, to the spiritual life, to spiritual maturity is being able to put your trust in Christ. It's not all the stuff you do. The stuff is only as meaningful as a focus on the object of your trust. Don't get me wrong. Practice these disciplines. Pray, fast, study scripture, go to church, go to small group, do all the things. Do the stuff. It brings you to a place where God has promised to regularly meet us. Do good, but don't fall prey to the danger of letting your good disconnect you from trust in Christ. In other words, don't trust in the good you do. Trust in the one that guided you to do good. Ooh, that was good. In order to live this life fully, to make music out of your life, trust Christ with your life. His promise is not that everything will be easy. The promise is simply that, yo, lo, I will be with you always, even to the ends of the earth. It won't be easy, but you will never be alone. And if God is for you, what could possibly be against you? So let me invite you to make the decision to trust Christ and trust him today. Let's pray. God of grace and mercy, Lord of light and love, we thank you. And we ask for your forgiveness for the ways we have not trusted you for the ways we have trusted in ourselves, that we've trusted in resources, we've trusted in jobs, we've trusted in, in money and, and, and things, we've tried to trust and seek and pursue happiness over everything else. We've trusted so many things that we have forgotten to try to trust you. We've trusted in our good behavior, thinking that that somehow barters favor with you. And we have missed that you have not come to make us happy. You have come to make us holy. But if we would be holy, then we would be happy. So God, guide us, teach us, lead us, help us, empower us to trust you so that we might return to the joy of our salvation. And in all of it, God, we will give you glory. For you alone are worthy. In Jesus' name, amen.